Hello, this is Anya. This is part two in our Bible study series on the Book of Jubilees. I am doing this series on behalf of Jackson Snyder. Jackson Snyder uh, has a group called the Yahad, and I have worked with him in the past, and a lot of my teachings have been initiated because he wanted me to do a teaching for him for his various events or just for regular studies for people. So that's what this that's where this Jubilee st series comes from. His prodding me to do a series on Jubilees for for the people in the Yahad. But it works out for my benefit as well because uh, I can also share this series with my YouTube channel for those who follow my work and and for people on Facebook as well. They can they can uh, see my perspective on Jubilees. I don't think I've done before this. I don't think I've done a, a series on Jubilees, so this is new for my channel, and I intend to go through the entire book of Jubilees from start to finish. This, it's, it, right now the uh, videos are very, uh, it tends to only cover a few chapters in each video, so right now we are at, at this point, we have reached the sixth, uh, the sixth, uh, series, but it's going to be a lot more than that. It's probably going to be closer to, I would say, close in the 20s, probably, depending how much we can cover in future, future sessions. So with that said, this is part two, as I said, and uh, I just want to mention before I start that my Patreon supporter, Daniel Simpson, uh, he is doing $25 a month, so uh, that's greatly appreciated. One of the one of the rewards for the Patreon support is being mentioned in the videos that I make as a supporter, so I definitely want to mention that and that his support is greatly appreciated. Anyone else who would like to support what I'm doing, they can they can donate through Patreon directly. They can all, you can also donate through other means, but Patreon is probably the easiest. So um, there's different levels of support. You can do the you can do the one dollar level, which gives you basic, uh, basically a rec name recognition. You, I will, I will mention your name in my videos and books if you were my supporter. Ten dollars a month, we can do. We will. You that basically gets you a one Google Hangouts conference each month with me. Twenty-five dollars a month gives you two Google Hangouts a month. And fifty dollars every month gives you four Google Hangouts every month with me. Then, if you do a hundred dollars a month, I will visit you for a twenty-four hour period once a year. Two hundred and fifty dollars, I will visit you um, twice a year, and for a twenty-four hour period. And the five hundred dollar level per month is I will visit you three times for a twenty-four hour period each time in a year. And the $1,000 level per month would be, I would visit you four times a year for each time being a 24 hour period. And it's a high, it's a high level of support, a thousand, but uh, depending where you live, that could be a good chunk of the, re the money that you're paying me. Um, for some people, you know, to visit them four times a year, it could cost a lot of money to do plane plane tickets, for example, if they live on somewhere else in the world. So, um, other people, it might not be that much money to visit them four times a year. They might be close by. But so, that amount 
is reasonable considering traveling fees. So if you want me to visit you four times a year, a thousand dollars a month would, would definitely enable me to do that. It would also indicate support for what I'm trying to do as well. So with that said, uh, this is the part two of Jubilees. Hope you enjoy it. All right. We've got uh, Unia, Andrew Carlson, here today, who's going to talk about Jubilees in Enoch, a pseudepigrapha, and give us some of the clues to why this material is so important to us yet today. And here's Professor Carlson. Hello, everyone. Last time we, I did like a very basic overview of Jubilees, but I didn't really dive into the text too much. This this time I want to get a little bit into Jubilees specifically of, of certain passages and kind of show some connections and insights that Jubilees has for us. I've done a little bit of an outline this time. So first of all, the purpose of Jubilees, it says in the, in the beginning of the book of Jubilees that it's a witness and testimony to future generations. Basically that Elohim is faithful. Um, this idea that Jubilees informs us ahead of time that when, if Israel forsakes the covenant and forsakes the law, they will be punished, they will be sent into exile amongst the Gentiles, the Gentiles, uh, but that Elohim has not abandoned them. He's being faithful to his covenant. I'll, let me see if I, where that specific passage is, I'll, I'll read it here. Okay, so it says, Do thou write for thyself all these words which I declare unto thee this day, for I know their rebellion and their stiff neck. And then it says, This witness shall be heard for a witness against them. They will forget all my commandments. They will walk after the Gentiles. It talks about how then they will be they will perish, they'll be taken captive, because they have forsaken his commandments and ordinances. It also specifies because they have forsaken his festivals and his Sabbaths and the holy place. Let's see. So in context of this, when do you think that that portion was written? Do you have any kind of idea as to what period the, uh, the, the prophet here talks about forsaking ordinances? It pre Jubilees presents itself as being directly spoken to Moses on Mount Sinai right before, right, right at the time when he comes down with the tablets. He comes down with the tablets containing the Ten Commandments and he sees there in sin, he throws those tablets and breaks them. It's right before that when he's on the mountain for 40 days, that's when Jubilees kind of presents itself as happening. And it's suggesting that right from the Elohim knows ahead of time that oh. Israel is not going to be faithful and they're going to go against the law. They're going to forget the law. And uh, it specifically says, I'm trying to find it here. Sorry about this. But basically, it's either in the first chapter. I, th I think it's in the. I think it's in the first chapter where he says that he is faithful, he is righteous, and that just because they are being punished for their sins doesn't mean he's completely abandoned them. He will come back to them, provided they, in exile, they 
see their sins, they forsake their sins, and they return. And upon doing that, they will they will be uh, blessed and restored. So the Book of Jubilees is really given, was written for Israel as a sign for them that, because like a lot of Jews today are, are atheists or they're, they're not very religious. And I, that's what I've heard. And one of the reasons is because, like, you know, with the Holocaust, for example, that was a pretty brutal thing. And, and a lot of the Jews felt like God abandoned them. So, because how could he let them go through something so horrible like that? But Jubilee serves as a witness to these people that he hasn't abandoned them. He's waiting for them to repent and return to the law. Because according to the covenant, that's the terms of the covenant. Once they, once they turn from that, they can then come back and they will be blessed. He, he wants to bless them, but there's certain terms that they have to fulfill first. And so that's, Jubilee tries to emphasize that for, for Israel. Um, you see, I want to make sure I can... I, I'm sorry to keep bugging you. One more thing. No, sure. So this, uh, purportedly, this book's written sometime around 250 B.C., I don't know that that's the case, except if it was, then what is it saying to contemporaneous people? Pretty much the same thing. I mean, I yeah, I would say on I would say it's emphasizing that principle of of this is why you Israel is suffering. This is why they are are not being blessed because they are not in line with the requirements of the covenant. That's one of the big things of the Essenes, you know, when they separated and they formed their community and the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had this understanding that they were the remnant and that the mainstream Judaism, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they had gone off the path. And mm -hmm. because they had gone off the path, that's why they had been taken over by the Romans. The Romans actually had power over them, and, and the Essenes believed that that was because the Pharisees and Sadducees had made compromises on the law and were not faithful. And as a result, they were uh, overpowered and under the control of, of the Gentiles, specifically the Romans. So I would say that's a very good context for the, you know, 250, 150 uh, BC period. Now I know R. H. Charles, one of the more one of the famous scholars who worked on the Book of Jubilees. He did it before the Dead Sea Schools were found, and his scholarship suggested that uh, the Book of Jubilees originated sometime around uh, 100 BC or a little bit earlier. But with Dead Sea Schools being discovered, it seems some strong evidence pointing Jubilees to be a good amount earlier than what R.H. Charles said. Yeah, I know around 250 to 200, there were, uh, well, there were uprisings both in uh, first and second century BC, but especially bad at the end of the second century BC. And so some have thought that it was coming up uh, at that time. But I seem to think that it's a much older book than that because of the calendrical texts in there. Is it possible it's older? Or, I mean, you can't, you can't use like the, uh, the uh, four source theory on it. That doesn't work. No. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that there's a passage later on which talks about um, Israelites being commanded to, or not Israelites, um, people being commanded to wear clothes and not to uncover themselves. Uh, that's in Jubilees uh, in like chapter three, I think. And one of, the, one of the classic commentaries that some people do, some scholars do is they say that's evidence of Maccabean, Maccabean, uh, like, Jubilees being authored during the Maccabean era, 
because it was a polemic against the the Greeks during the games uh, when they exposed themselves because you had to the the men who wanted to participate in the Olympic games and some of that stuff they had to they had to be naked or mostly naked you know and but the thing is it's such a it's easy to to read into it your conclusion that you've already made but if you if you back off and try to get out of the, the scholarly bias you can see that the whole idea of don't uh, expose yourselves as the Gentiles do that could apply to virtually any era because the Gentiles have always been like that for as long as we know they've always exposed themselves uh, through various uh, customs so it seems like one of their we weaker arguments to suggest that it originates so late just because it's commanding people not to expose their their nakedness yeah it could you know be anytime if that's the case yeah exactly now i did find the passage where he says where elohim is saying in jubilee chapter one says uh he says i shall not forsake them nor fail them for i am the lord their god and he speaks of how if they turn to him, he will gather them from amongst the Gentiles. And he, he spoke he spoke of uh, sending sending witnesses. And this is an interesting thing in the context of our movement because there's a lot of people who are attacking the law, be it mainstream Christians, as well as certain groups that are more recent trying to who were joining the Yahad group online, the think tank, basically arguing that the that uh, veganism is morally required of all people, and that all the passages of the law, which speak in favor of animal sacrifices and eating animals, that those are all forged and a hoax, and that the law is false. These are people attacking the law from different angles, and we're trying to, the Ahaz specifically is trying to point us back to the law, not necessarily keep every aspect of it at this point in time, because there's certain things we can't do, like we can't do animal sacrifices right now, but uh, we understand from the historical context of the, of the scriptures that the sacrifices were, were part of the law and that they weren't added. And so Jubilees basically says that Elohim would send witnesses, like basically prophets, to witness against them, but warned that Israel would not hear and they would they would kill. Oops, what's going on there? <laughs> um, there we go. So basically, uh, we're warned ahead of time that. The prophets would be killed and we saw throughout history that they were killed and they were killed because their message was controversial it, it they, the israelites didn't like what they were saying and then it also says in jubilees they will persecute those who seek the law and they will abrogate abrogate and change everything so as to work evil abrogation is very common amongst christianity they teach the abrogation of the law and we see that amongst the same group who's trying to alter the law so that the sacrifices were never part of the law to begin with so this this is something we're seeing that we will be persecuted if we try to seek the law you know those who try to keep the sabbath uh we live in a world where they don't really respect keeping those the sabbath uh there are there's a movement throughout the current modern times of trying to eradicate circumcision there there are various places where circumcision is becoming outlawed in certain places in the u.s and in other countries it's becoming illegal to circumcise 
And so there's different things like that which are very relevant to our time of, and what the Messiah said also, where he told us they attacked him, they will also attack us. If we try to be his disciples, we're going to suffer the same way that he suffered. Maybe even suffer more than he suffered because some people go through horrible stuff. Luckily right now, we, in those who are in first world countries don't face that much persecution compared to uh, other countries in Africa and certain places in Asia. But that's not always going to be the case. It's going to be that eventually Europe is going to, and they've already started doing this, but they're going to be strongly persecuting those who are trying to follow the ways of the, of the Bible. Anyway, so that Jubilee just presents to us this understanding that it is explaining to us that if we forsake the law, we will suffer. But if we return to the law, we will be blessed. And that's very much in harmony with, with, uh, with like Deuteronomy, for example, gives us the blessings and the curses. If you keep the law, you will be blessed. If you break the law, you will be cursed. So that's just, it helps us to understand why there's so much suffering in the world. It's because his commandments are not being kept. And sometimes we feel like, where is Elohim? Where is he? We know where he is. He's waiting for us. That's the key. Another interesting thing is Moses begs Israel to be spared from this. Let's see. He says, it says, O Lord my God, do not forsake thy people and thy inheritance, so that they should wander in the error of their hearts, and do not deliver them into the hands of their enemies, the Gentiles, lest they should rule over them and cause them to sin against thee. Basically, Moses heard from Elohim that all this bad stuff's going to happen to Israel. It is going to happen because they are going to forsake, forsake the law. Moses is begging Elohim, please change their hearts right now so they don't have to do this. Because he knows that Elohim has, the, has a lot of power to change people's hearts. So he's asking Elohim, please change their hearts right now so that these things don't have to happen, so that Israel can always be righteous. Please make it so that Israel will always be faithful from right now until the end of time. And then Elohim responds to him and says, basically says he's not going to do that because of their free will. He, it says in verse 22, I know their contrariness in their thoughts and their stiff neckedness, and they will not be obedient till they confess their own sin and the sin of their fathers. And after this, they will turn to me in all uprightness. So, and, and he says, after they turn to him, then he'll circumcise their hearts and create in them the Holy Spirit and cleanse them from their sins. So it's because of their will. Elohim reveals to Moses that he can't get, he can't intervene and prevent them from falling away because that would require him to directly violate their will. And he's not going to do that. So it kind of helps explain to us why we're in the situation we're in because of free will Elohim knew that he had to let these bad things happen so that they could eventually realize how far they had fallen and come back. It's kind of similar to what Paul said in his letter to the Romans where he said, Israel had to fall so that the Gentiles could be brought in. Uh, but once the Gentiles are brought in, then Israel will be restored. So this is the idea that uh, it, the, be the best way to save the whole world is first for people to fall so that they can then be restored. Because uh, it's difficult for people to always be faithful no matter what. Because if people haven't experienced the consequences of sin, they're likely to think sin is not a big deal. If they think, oh, sin is sin, whatever, it's not that big a deal, then they
cryo screen. Everything freezes. While we're frozen, can I make a comment? Sure, if you turn up a little bit. I'm too low. Let's see, how do I do Not that? Not loud enough. Just get um, a little closer. Am I loud enough now? Yes. Okay. Um, the part where he's talking about where Yah says that he's not going to go with the people because they are stiff-necked. Um, later, after Moses negotiates with them, he actually says he will go with the people for the same reason, because they are stiff-necked. And what I understand that to be is um, because we were so stubborn in the beginning to not follow his laws that once we um, made our error and repented that we would be similarly stubborn uh, in keeping the laws. So when the last time of testing and trial comes upon us that we won't turn. Isn't that something like what uh, I guess the writer of Hebrews maybe says that once you've tasted of this, if you ever turn again, would that kind of um, emphasize what you're saying there? Yeah, maybe. If they were, if they were going to turn, they well, they better not. Are you back, uh, Onia? Let's see. See if I can get him here. And then it might have been the Essene rapture. He might have just gone right up. I messaged him. One of the reasons I ask him to do this particular book is it's just so hard to get through. I mean, there's a lot of it, and a lot of it is repetitive. Yet inside there, there is the affirmation of calendar and some things about uh, geology, ge geography. Hold on a minute. Somebody's after me here. Maybe it's him. Yeah, he says he's coming back on. His internet messed up, and here he comes. But Jubilees is kind of a mystery book for me. It just seems like I get to the middle of it and then, ah, uh, stop. Tried to record it once, and the same thing happened. Just got bogged down. He had to do a restart. Daoud, I love this profile picture of yours. It is so cool. Daoud's in Holland. We became friends a couple of, of months ago, and what a nice family he has. Oh, here's Onia. Did you did you go to the phone? Uh, 
Andrew, is your phone working? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, good. My apologies, uh, the internet cut out for me. I don't know why that happened, but I was actually using my computer, but uh, if this happens again, I'll just switch to my, I'll try it on my phone. Hopefully that won't happen again though. Uh, do you know, what was the last thing I said where it cut off? You were talking about the uh, contemporaneous sins of Israel. Maybe I was talking about that. And the, uh, the use of the warning, no matter what time or what, what era it was. Was that where he was? Anybody? Yeah, I also think we... Uh... I was mentioning how uh, if um, basically it explains in Jubilees, it explains why there's so much suffering in the world is because people are sinning and, and not following the law. And that's why it seems, it seems like Elohim's not there because we're, it's not that Elohim's abandoning us. We are abandoning him. That's basically what Jubilees is telling us. Mm -hmm. And tells us that if we return to the law, repent in our hearts, then he will restore blessings to us and give us the things we desire. But if we turn away from him, then we will be punished for it. And that's the basic message of Jubilees. That's how it starts off in chapter 1. Now, another, another interesting thing is Jubilees tells us the name of Jerusalem. There's a lot of people who, uh, who believe that Jerusalem, like for example, the Samaritans do not believe that Jerusalem is the holy place. They believe that was a corruption and that the original holy place was Mount Gerizim. According to Jubilees, however, Jerusalem is, in fact, the holy place where the temple was to be built. There's multiple indications throughout the text that Jerusalem is considered a holy place. And in terms of for our own time, we see that there's so much controversy in the land of Israel today. It just makes too much sense for Jerusalem not to be holy because of all the stuff throughout history that's focused on Jerusalem. Even today, everything's focused on it. Like there's just so much importance to the land of Israel and Jerusalem specifically. And I think Jubilees helps to confirm the, the importance of Jerusalem. Now, Jubilees as a text is presented as being given to Moses through the angel of the presence, this figure is called. It's, the, the manuscripts differ a little bit in who is being commanded to write the copy of Jubilees. But basically what we can, what we can get from the information that we have in the manuscripts and in the context of Jubilees is that either the angel of presence writes the book of Jubilees and gives that book to Moses, or or the angel of the presence writes an account for Moses and then Moses basically writes a copy himself. Moses actually writes a copy where, that the angel is dictating to Moses directly. In either case, either Moses is given the writing or Moses makes a copy of the writing. But that's the origin of Jubilees according to this text. And it's, as I mentioned the other time, it corresponds with what the New Testament's claims about the origin of the law, that the, the law originated from angels. And it also, an interesting thing is there's a passage of, of, in Paul's writings where he speaks about the worship of angels. And some people believe that that's referring to like what Enoch, like stuff in Enoch where they, you know, they elevate angels and, and attribute certain powers to different types of angels. But I believe that Paul may have meant it as this basic idea that 
those following, those who are under the law, as Paul, Paul's phrase he likes to use, those who are under the law are serving the angels. The basic idea that the law came from angels, and instead of following the Messiah, they're following the angels by being under the law. That's what it appears that Paul's claims are. Consider this. There's the worship of angels like, wow, we'll crowd them on there, like directly worshiping the demigod. And then there's the worship of angels, the way they worship. I was thinking Song of the Sabbath Sacrifice for one might be a really good example of the worship of angels in the sense that angels worship this way and we worship in a way fashion like them i know about every commentary i've ever read or done on that says that they were worshiping angels but angels worship too yeah and along the line that lines you just said uh jubilees actually says in many places that israel was to be like the angels in that they are to keep the sabbath like the angels keep the Sabbath, and they are to be circumcised because the angels are circumcised. There's there's uh, different things throughout Jubilees which kind of emphasize that connection that you just made of this idea of the worship of angels. Do you consider it then a mystical book? Jubilees? Yeah. Mystical in the sense of, like, what? how would you mean? Oh, I, I mean... Um maybe exoteric, maybe beneath the surface or above the surface. Well, I know that Second Esdras, the book Second Esdras, portrays Jubilees as a secret book, as like a special esoteric book that is not for everyone, but for those who are more enlightened on and and there are certain things in Jubilees that are controversial, you know, it's like same thing with Book of Enoch, the whole thing with the, the sin of the watchers. That's probably a lot of people can be messed up by that type of stuff, or they can they can not take the Bible seriously if they know that the Bible says stuff about about angels having offspring with people. It seems, for a lot of people, it seems too hard to believe. But this is a very strong teaching throughout Jubilees and Enoch, this understanding that the angels corrupted creation, and, and ultimately it seems that the angels doing this directly resulted in the origination of a lot of like mythology, like Greek mythology, and different cultures have their different gods, and a lot of these gods that they worship are eerily reminiscent to the, the characterizations that we see of the Nephilim that are mentioned in, in Enoch and Jubilees. Now, there is something I want to speak on. The Book of Jubilees gives an account of creation, and there's certain differences when you compare with Genesis. Sometimes there's extra stuff, sometimes there's, a, there's a fewer stuff. But what's very interesting is that, for example, Genesis nowhere speaks of the creation of angels. Why is that? You would think, you would think there would be a creation of, of angels. But at least in our copies, there is nothing to be found. In Jubilees, however, it specifically states that the angels were created on the first day of creation. It says in verses, verses 2 through 4, or two through three, actually. Jubilee chapter two, verses two to three. It's the creation of angels. It's also the creation of the earth, the heavens, and the waters. But it speaks of the angels of the presence, 
angels of sanctification, angels of fire, with the winds, clouds, darkness, snow, hail, uh, all kinds of natural phenomena. And it speaks of all, all the spirits of his creatures which are in the heavens and on the earth. So there's all this understanding that the, the spirits, the angels, were created on this first day. And it, it's, I refer to it, 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 it's called, there's a thing that's called biblical animism. I don't know if you people have heard of that. But animism is this basic idea that all of creation has a spirit that, is alive and this concept you can see it in the bible and other places like in in psalm 148 for example it speaks of the different creation praising elohim it has the it has the fire and hail the snow and the clouds the wind the mountains uh, trees all kinds of things praising him and there's also a, a a text included in some copies of the book of Daniel called the prayer and song of the three holy children and this is a long hymn of of how all creation is expected to praise and bless and glorify Elohim this is understanding that all of creation has spirits this is a very biblical idea but it's frowned upon by a lot of people as like a as like a pagan thing but we see that originally in judaism it had this strong notion that everything is alive everything has a spirit so it's originally a very jewish and biblical thing but over time because of the influence of mainstream christianity it came to be regarded as a pagan thing rather than a biblical thing but so jubilees is a strong confirmation of this concept that there's spirits and everything well it sure is coming back especially in the 80s and 90s with the uh, genre they call creation the creation theology or yeah creation theology where the idea of everything being alive in some respect in the elohim is uh examined well, just a plethora of authors and mystics in the 80s and the 90s. I think the leader of that would be Matthew Fox. And they do use Jubilees for part of that, their theology. Creation, oh, wow. spirituality, that's what they call it. Yeah, we had to study a lot, a lot, a lot of that in seminary at the time. But I haven't seen much of it lately. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's interesting. Um, now, in the same passage, it also seems to speak of pre-existence of the soul. This is this idea that before the soul was created, there was a consciousness that pre-existed it. And it appears to say that in this passage of Jubilees where it said, not only did he create all the, the, the angels on the first day, he also created all the spirits of his creatures which are in the heavens and on the earth it appears to be saying that all the creatures that would ever live in the heavens and on the earth he created their spirits on the first day and that makes sense because why would elohim like it says that elohim created all things in the six days it doesn't make sense that every time people every time people sleep together that Elohim has to be like, oh, I got to make a new spirit now. Someone just had sex. Ding, ding, ding. You know, like every time someone has sex, he has to create a new spirit. That doesn't make sense. It makes sense that all the spirits are already created. Then every time people sleep together, a spirit is sent into the, uh, into the, uh, the fetus. Now, I will say though, there is a apocrypha book in the Ethiopian Bible, the the Book of Clement which suggests that the soul of a fetus originates, basically comes into existence on the 40th day. So for the first 40 days after conception, there's no soul and there's no life. And so I would imagine that the spirit does not enter the fetus at conception, but enters on the 40th day. Uh, so it wouldn't be, but the principle remains the same that, 
it doesn't make sense for a spirit to be created 40 days after people conceive. It just, it makes more sense that everything has already been created and now it just happens in its time. It may, that makes more sense to me and it seems to be in, in line with what Jubilees is saying here. Now, I'm going to read a passage in Jubilees and then a passage in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is like basically a quotation or a reference, a strong connection that it cannot be coincidence and shows a strong link between Jubilees and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, we already know there's a strong link between the Dead Sea Scrolls and Jubilees because so many copies of Jubilees were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but this is just even more confirmation that Jubilees is... Uh, connected to ancient writings. So I'll read the passage. It's, the angels are speaking, and it says, the different things that were created on the first day, and uh, goes on to say, the abysses and the darkness, eventide and the light, dawn and day, which he hath prepared in the knowledge of his heart. And thereupon we the angels were talking, thereupon we saw his works and praised him and lauded before him on account of all his works. For seven great works did he create on the first day. But notice that phrase, dawn, light, dawn, and day, which he hath prepared in the knowledge of his heart. That's a very specific phrase. Now we go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and what do we see? This is the hymn to the Creator in the Psalms scroll. There was a special copy of the book of Psalms, which was much longer, had many extra Psalms. The Psalms were in a different order. But overall, it's like a copy of the book of Psalms. And it has this to say in the hymn to the Creator. Great and holy are you, Yahweh, the most holy from generation to generation. In front of him walks glory, and behind him the din of many waters. Kindness and truth are found, or excuse me, are around his face. Truth a brightness and justice are the base of his throne. Now here's the part. He separated light from darkness, the dawn he established with the knowledge of his heart. Then all his angels saw and sang, for he showed them what they had not known. It goes on a little further, the, the hymn to the creator, but that thing right there, I'll, I'll read just the, the specific parts again. So Jubilee says, And the light, dawn, and day, which he hath prepared in the knowledge of his heart, and thereupon we, the angels, saw his works and praised him and lauded before him on account of all his works. That's Jubilees. Him to the Creator says, probably David doing this, but we don't know for sure if it was David, but it says, He separated light from darkness, the dawn he established with, or in, because in Hebrew with and in is the same prefix. So the dawn he established in the knowledge of his heart. Then all his angels saw and sang, for he showed them what they had not known. So that's a striking parallel, which strongly connects the Dead Sea Scrolls with Jubilees, and helps to reinforce the authority and authenticity of Jubilees. Because it would make more sense for the writer of the Psalms to be quoting Jubilees if Jubilees is purported to be older than David and be in the time of Moses, it makes sense for the Davidic Psalter to be deriving this, uh, these phrases from Jubilees. It doesn't make as much sense for the author of Jubilees to be deriving these phrases from the, the book of Psalms, this, this extra psalm, because uh, if the author of Jubilees is trying to make people believe that this is an authentic mosaic writing, they wouldn't take, they wouldn't quote from later writings. Because by quoting from later writings, it would expose their writing to be a, a forgery. So they would, they would try to avoid quoting later writings. Instead, they would try to make it look like they're the older writing. The fact that this psalm that I read from is so similar to what Jubilee says, it's more likely that the psalm is derived from Jubilees rather than the other way around. That's how I see it. Now, there are some interesting things 
when you compare Jubilees. I mentioned last time that Jubilees had some agreements with like Septuagint against the Masoretic text. There are certain readings that agree specifically with Septuagint, like Genesis 1, verse 9. It has a longer form. Did you want to say something, Jackson? No, uh, you said it. You, you think that uh, Genesis came second and used Jubilees to, to provide uh, a different point of view? Yeah, so I believe that Jubilees use Genesis Apocryphon, which I mentioned before, as its source text. Then Genesis came along afterwards, used, used Jubilees as like a groundwork, but also copied from Genesis Apocryphon as well. So Genesis has some stuff that Jubilees doesn't, and I believe that's because Genesis takes that from Genesis Apocryphon as well. But there does appear to be, to me, there appears to be signs of later age in Genesis, whereas Jubilees appears to be the more primitive, since it's more, it has more connections with some of these older writings, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, Enoch, for example. Genesis appears to be very much a secondary account, like its account of Enoch is so vague. It says Enoch walked with God and he was not. That implies there's another account somewhere. Basically, like, here's a very brief summary of what happened to Enoch. You guys already know the story. You guys already know the story. Enoch walked with God. It's just giving a summary as if they already knew the background. Jubilees doesn't do that. Jubilees explains it. And that makes some sense if Jubilees is trying to tell people what happened that didn't know what happened necessarily. Whereas Genesis seems to be telling people stuff as if they knew what already happened. There is actually a passage in Genesis which confirms that the writer was writing to an audience that already had a knowledge of the story. For example, it says uh, in chapter 13 of Genesis, verse 10, it says, And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zoar. So that phrase, before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, that wouldn't make sense to add if this was the first time they were reading about Sodom and Gomorrah and the whole situation. It makes sense if they already knew that story that Sodom and Gomorrah had been destroyed. They're like, oh, okay. This is just reminding us this is before they were destroyed. Jubilees doesn't make that uh, clarification, I don't believe. I believe it just presents it straight chrono chronologically. Now, One of the big differences between Genesis and Jubilees is Jubilees specifically states that the sun is a is the primary indicator of the holy times. It says in chapter 2, God appointed the sun to be a great sign on the earth for days and for Sabbaths and for months and for feasts and for years and for Sabbaths of years and for Jubilees and for all seasons of the years. That's a very explicit statement that the sun is the basis of the calendar for the holy times. A lot of people believe it's the lunar, the lunar cycle, the moon. But according to Enoch, it's the sun that's the primary, the 364-day calendar. And Jubilees is another witness to that understanding. Some people reject the book of Jubilees specifically for that reason, that it teaches a contrary calendar understanding. You notice in Jubilees, if you've look, ever looked at the uh, Sefer or Kefir Bible, that it retains Jubilees in the Bible, but when it comes to the word um, um, Kodesh, yeah, even though to have the moon become the beginning of the month is completely, completely contradictory in that book. They still translate it as new moon. 
in there. Which is I, was, I didn't use it. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. And I will say about the Sefer, you know, I have friends who value the Sefer and support it. And instead, you know, there's certain good things about it, like having a bunch of books in the same compilation. But overall, I think I don't find the Sefer to be very scholarly. And it appears to me, I could be wrong on this, but it appears to me that they didn't freshly translate everything. They mainly took previous translations and, you know, they, they translated a few parts of it to update it. But uh, I would say that just understand that when you're getting the Sefer, you're mainly paying for the people doing the work of making it into Hebraic, like putting the words into Hebraic forms, inserting the Aleph Tav, um, I actually I actually have stated before in other teachings that I don't agree with the whole concept of the Aleph Tav as it's commonly t taught. I don't believe it's a every time you see it that it refers to the Messiah. I believe it's a grammatical marker. That's how Hebrew indicates what it what it is. And so it's to me it seems kind of silly to transliterate Aleph Tav every time you you see it as if it has a significance greater than the direct object marker. The way I do it in a translation, when I do translation, when I try to do stuff like that, I render Aleph Tav as a colon. And the basic idea of the colon is just to, to tell you this Aleph Tav is marking this verb with that noun it's, or that object. It's, it's, a, it's a marker. So it should be translated as a marker. It shouldn't be rendered as if it's a special name of like the Messiah or something. But that's what some people seem to make it to be. What is that anyway? I, I don't understand why they put that in there. Where, where do you see that? I think it's because of how it says in Revelation, the Alpha and the Omega. They change it to Aleph and the Tav. And they believe that, oh, see, Revelation is saying that he is the Aleph and the Tav. So that means every time we see Aleph Tav in Scripture, that's that's the Messiah. Well, that's kind of fishy in itself, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's not credible amongst uh, you know Hebrew linguists. It's it's uh, understanding arrived at based on what's the term exegesis? Is that what it is, or what, whatever that word is? Can I it's, say something on that? Sure. Um, where it says that he is the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end, if you actually substitute the, the phrase beginning and the end in those places, then it sort of takes on the essence of when he created these things, he created the beginning and the end of it. So, for, the, for example, in, in creating seeds, um, he's creating the entire species for all time in that initial seed because it continues to regenerate. And just like um, the scriptures say that Levi paid tithes through Abraham while he was in his loins, you know, he was, he was there in essence because of that. So when he created man, at, um, you know, man, that it was the beginning and end of man and the beginning and end of seed and the beginning and end of heavens and so forth. And that, that's how I looked at it. Oh, uh, so you, take every time you see the Aleph and the Tav, you understand that to be the beginning and the end, like having that meaning? Right, because um, you know how when there's the uh, account of creation, it gets uh, translated as past tense, you know, on the first day he created this, but from what I understand, if you don't really, um, if you accept the Vav consecutive idea as it being turned into a um, a past tense that's one thing but I think it's like a dual understanding that it's also a future tense that he he will do this and he will do that and so it is um, I think a way of looking at um, that it, it was happening then and then it's also happening later you know like when um, Cain brings his offering I think it says that in the last days he brings his um, offering it, it gets um, translated as something as like in the course of time or something like that. But you could also see it as a future prophetic idea. 
Yeah, I, I think there can be, you know, I think there can be like uh, certain words when they're used, you know, they can have deeper hidden meanings. Uh, but I think the primary meaning of of the that Aleph Tov is is this understanding that pointing you towards the object of what the verb is that you see that you see it used like that grammatically in throughout Hebrew literature it's used as that connecting point of and also it's the Aleph Tov also is sometimes used as a I believe it's called a preposition um, it's used to mean with in certain places if I remember correctly so this idea of with is also directly connected to this direct object marker because it's like joining it to something it's linking it to something that's how I understand the Alexab but at any rate you know it's the the Sefer has a lot of books in there so if you want a single book that has uh, all the books in there it can be good for that purpose but it is very expensive um, to put it's, it's expensive for what you're uh, getting because you're not getting like a fresh translation necessarily you're getting something that's there's already translations like that available which are almost identical you're just getting the convenience of having it all in one one tidy package yeah it's a hundred but it's yeah like a hundred dollars and a lot of people can't afford something like that and if you had the time to do it yourself you could actually take all the books put them together and you could probably sell it for significantly cheaper um and still make a profit you know if based on my knowledge of like i i've done stuff like uh for example with uh, Lulu, I, I've printed books from Lulu before. 800 pages, hardcover, 800 pages, cost about thirty dollars, thirty-five dollars maybe. Um, I don't know what, how many pages the Etzefer is, but I would imagine that it they could charge fifty dollars for it, but they charge all like a hundred dollars. So it seems if people value it, I think. It can be good, but I would, I w I don't recommend the Sefer for people to buy, for certain cer some of those reasons. There's a um, scourge of doing that, the self-publishing other people's works or public domain works, and oft times, well, even my stuff has been republished by people unscrupulous and sold for six dollars, like the Nazarene Acts. But when you get them, you know, it seems like a a real good deal when you get them the print is about six point print yeah. i mean it's put in the smallest book it can get and it's just unreadable anyway so i i was mad at one fellow that republished the nazarene acts right beside mine on lulu and uh because it was not because he republished it it's in public domain but because he, uh, the, the type in it is so small and there's no chapters or anything just to slap it down and maybe make a few dollars that way. Yeah, that, I don't like that. But anyways, you know, we get back to Jubilees. Um, one of the strangest things is that scholars have this idea that in some ways it makes sense, but it's used in a, I think it's used too much. This basic idea that if a reading doesn't make sense, it's more likely to be authentic. I think sometimes that's the case, but not always, but they use it as a way of trying to support the Masoretic text as the, as the authoritative version. Even the main, even the scholars who are open to the Dead Sea Scrolls, they are still highly pro-Masoretic in a strong way, and I think it's too much bias towards the Masoretic. One of the key examples is the, it's in chapter two, verse two, and it says, 
And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. In the Septuagint, it says on the sixth day, God ended his work. In the Samaritan, it says on the sixth day. In the Syriac Peshitta, it says on the sixth day. In the Old Latin, which is based on the Septuagint, again, sixth day. Jubilee says as well the sixth day. So we have so many witnesses pointing to the correct reading being the sixth day, but scholars still think that the seventh day reading is correct because it's a more difficult reading. When it makes more sense to me that scribes had to write it by hand, so sometimes they got confused and got ahead of themselves and, and wrote words from the following line. Seventh day is mentioned twice immediately after. It says, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. So it makes more sense that to me that the Masoretic text is an error and simply copied the seventh day too many times, one too many times, because they looked ahead. Because all these other witnesses, including Jubilees and the other copies of Genesis, are in agreement that it was the sixth day. So that's one example of how Jubilees can help us solve textual issues. It shows us that the original version of Genesis almost definitely said sixth day. And, and it makes sense that if, if the seventh day is the Sabbath, you're not supposed to work on the seventh day. So Elohim wouldn't end his work on the seventh day because then that would mean he was actually working on the seventh day. It would make sense that he ended his work on the sixth day. Now, as I mentioned in previous, the previous week, Jubilees has a controversial teaching about the Sabbath and Israel. Basically, according to Jubilees, Israel alone was sanctified, permitted, and commanded to keep the Sabbath day holy. And it explains why. According to Jubilees, there were 22 works of creation, and the 23rd creation was the creation of the Sabbath. The 23rd was the holy, the set apart. The 22 was the work. The 23rd was the holiness of the Sabbath. In the same way, we're told that Jacob, from Adam to Jacob, Jacob is the 23rd generation. And you arrive at that through the inclusion of the extra Canaan. In the genealogy, in the Gospel of Luke, there's an extra Canaan that's not in our copies of Genesis. This extra Canaan is supported by the Septuagint of Genesis and supported by Jubilees. So Jacob is the 23rd generation according to this account. And because he's the 23rd and the Sabbath was the 23rd, the author of Jubilees is essentially saying that that's why Jacob was sanctified to be holy and chosen. Uh oh. See if we can get him back. This is excellent knowledge. Hmm. There he is. So, yeah, sorry about that internet again but this time i came back really quickly so um but so according to this apocrypha of the of the, the book of clement and some of the other writings in the ethiopian new testament it tells us the sabbath was extended it's no longer just for israel but now it's for all believers who are baptized into the true faith because what's the whole idea? According to Jubilees, only people who are sanctified as his peculiar people, his holy nation, are able to keep the Sabbath holy. 
according to these New Testament writings, the church that was established by the Messiah was made into a new holy nation and they were sanctified. And now because they were sanctified, now they are expected to keep a Sabbath as well. So I don't think we should believe that just because Jubilee says only Israel was to keep the Sabbath, that, uh, that we don't, that people today don't have to keep it if they're not Israel because new laws were added uh, by the Messiah in, in the New Testament writings. And in these new laws, the Sabbath was specifically stated to be for all people who join the faith. Also, for anyone who's not been sure, how do you keep the Sabbath? The problem is our copies of the Old Testament don't really specify too much the laws of how to keep the Sabbath. Because of that, people turn to the the oral law to try to figure out what, uh, how do we keep the Sabbath? Well, let's look to the Jews, the, the Talmud, and try to figure that out. Um, well, that is fallacious because originally in the scriptures, there was writings which specified how to keep the Sabbath. And we see a remnant of that in Jubilees. Jubilees gives us all the laws for how to keep the Sabbath. And what's very strongly in favor of, of Jubilees list is that many things that Jubilees list as commandments for the Sabbath are corroborated by other books of the Old Testament, like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, and Nehemiah. They give laws for the Sabbath nowhere mentioned anywhere else in the writings, but it's mentioned in Jubilees. And as we've talked before, there is evidence in the Dead Sea Scrolls of an original law that had extra commandments. So it's very likely that the Temple Scroll and other Pentateuchal writings in in the scrolls had these laws that Jubilees has. So if you're ever unsure about how to keep the Sabbath, I would recommend going to Jubilees because it gives a very good law list of laws. They seem very logical and in sync with biblical principles. A more extreme form of to keep the Sabbath can be found in the rabbinic writings in the Talmud, as I said, and also in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is a more extreme form in the Damascus document. It's very possible that the Essenes went a little too far in some of how they kept the Sabbath. So if you want a more lax interpretation of how to keep the Sabbath, you can go to Jubilees. It's very reliable. The list is very reliable and not overbearing, I believe. Another thing which is, which is uh, important about Jubilees is that it shows us that that uh, people differ when they read Genesis. They think, oh, is, is Genesis compatible with old earth ideas? Is it, is, uh, you know, were there, were there other humans? Were there other humans other than Adam and Eve at the time? Were there, were there uh, creatures before Adam and Eve were formed? Things like that. If you take Jubilee's testimony as authority, Jubilees is a very narrow, specific interpretation of the same stuff that Genesis says, but in a way that you can't really reconcile with some of these other doctrines. It's very clearly specific that the first six days are literal 24-hour days and not long periods of time. According to Jubilees, they're very specific days. And it also, in Genesis, it's left unclear. Like it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And then it says what happens on the first day. So some people are not sure if the heavens and the earth were created on the first day. Some people think the heavens and the earth already existed prior to the first day. Jubilees, however, tells us explicitly that the heavens and the earth were created on the first day. So Jubilees gives no uh, ambiguity to this subject. It makes it very clear. Another one, for example, and a lot of people theorize that Cain did not marry. As I said, Cain married someone else. There were other humans, and Cain married someone else. According to Jubilees, Cain took his own sister as a wife. According to 
do you believe Seth took his own sister as a wife? And for several generations, they took their own sisters as wives. So there's this idea that originally sister and brother, at least according to Jubilees, was not considered incest. It, you have to also think from a logical perspective, at a certain point, there were only two humans, whether it was Adam and Eve or long before, there was only two humans. And when they had kids, those kids had to interbreed with each other. The siblings had to interbreed. So brother and sister incest, it was inevitable. Scientifically, it had to have originated somehow. So Jubilees basically embraces that understanding and says, okay, well, it's inevitable that it had to be that way. And we're telling you that Cain's sister was his wife. And there's a lot of things like, you know, some of the doctrines of Lilith, some of these doctrines of like how Cain had a, a different father that was like Satan or something or a demon. It just doesn't reconcile with the, how Jubilees presents the information. Um, an interesting thing as well is, well, I'll get to that in a second. This other thing is Jubilees tells us that for, for five days, Adam was brought animals to give names to them. One of the common arguments against Genesis being authentic is by some people they say, it's impossible that Adam was able to name all of animals on the same day, 24 hour day, it's impossible. Jubilees explains to us that it wasn't all on the same 24 hour day. It was over five days where he named all the different animals. That's a much more believable account. And according to Jubilees, Eve was created on the sixth day of the second week, not the first week. So that's filling in more information that Genesis doesn't give us. Um, have you guys ever seen in Genesis where it says like, let us, the phrase let us, when Elohim's talking, what does let us refer to? Let us do this, let us do that. Some people say that's referring to the Trinity. However, according to Jubilees, it's referring to the angels. And the Septuagint also, let, let, let me tell you, in one passage uh, of Genesis, it says, let me see where it is. It's when, it's when, um, Eve is being separated from Adam. Okay, verse 18. You know, the Lord of God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. The Septuagint says, instead, It is not good that the man should be alone. Let us make for him a help suitable to him. Jubilees agrees with that same thing. It's it says in Jubilees, uh, let's see here, I'm just going to read it specifically. And the Lord said unto us, the angels are talking in Jubilees, and the Lord said unto us, it is not good that the man should be alone. Let us make a helpmate for him. So this very subtle difference of let us versus I will, that one little difference is hugely significant because it shows, Jub Jubilees shows us that that phrase, let us, is re actually referring to the angels and not to the Trinity. So that's important to, you know, if people are, are arguing that it's referring to the Trinity, you can, you can use that Jubilees to show actually it says it's referring to angels and not other members of the Trinity. Now, we also see that according to Jubilees, because Adam was made on the seventh, uh, excuse me, on the, in the first week and Eve was made in the second week, for that reason, the origin of, you know, in the law, it gives a command for, for the first 40 days, the newborn male is 
to be purified and not to be in the holy place. And for the first 80 days, the newborn uh, female is also not to be in the holy place. Jubilees explains to us that the origin of that law is when after Adam was made, he could not enter the Garden of Eden for until 40 days, and Eve could not enter until 80 days. This understanding, however, is contrary to the order of Genesis. The way Genesis has it right now is basically Genesis has it that Adam is put into the garden by himself, and when he's in the garden by himself, Eve is formed. Jubilees directly contradicts that by saying that first Adam and Eve were separated, then they went into the garden separately after 40 and 80 days. So that's a contradiction between Jubilees and Genesis, but I believe the reason for that is that Genesis has been altered by the scribes. The order has been changed. There's evidence that the order of Genesis, like the chronology, is not always consistent. There's some passages, like some chapters, like I think it's Genesis chapter 35 and 36, something around there, where the following chapter chronologically is earlier. Like the chronology is mixed up in some of the chapters of Genesis. So t I do believe that Jubilees, what Jubilees says is authentic and that Genesis order is the one that's in, in, in error. And if this is true, if what Jubilees says is true, that's a very significant because that means if Adam and Eve could not enter the garden until they were purified 40 and 80 days, that means that there was uncleanness prior to Adam's sin. That, is a, that would strongly go against the traditional idea of Christianity because if there's uncleanness prior to the sin, that must mean there's also death prior to the sin of Adam. Because without, if there's no death, then there's no uncleanness. And cleanness only makes sense in the, cons, on, in the context of death. So, uh, Jubilees is a powerful evidence that there was death prior to Adam's sin. And that uncleanness is not just a, like, you've ever heard some people say that uncleanness is like a ceremonial law? But there's no evidence in the scriptures that uncleanness is a ceremonial law we see that it's actually a health law. It's very much in line with health and purification. Jackson, uh, how much longer do you want me to go, or when do you want me to end this? Well, we put down an hour and a half, so you got 10 minutes. I think, All right. oh, wait a minute, is that right? There's an hour and a half, you got 10 minutes. All right. Yeah, hey, you're doing great. Let's see what we can do in these final 10 minutes here. Another thing that's interesting is it tells us that every tree in the Garden of Eden was holy. By implication, it doesn't say it specifically, but since it says every tree is holy, that implies that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is holy. It was holy. So if it's holy, we know, for example, we know that in the law, you're not supposed to touch the Ark of the Covenant. If you even touch it, if you even touch it, you, d you die. And remember what Eve said. She said, we were commanded not to eat it, not to even touch it. So there's this idea that the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it's not evil. It's actually a holy tree, but it's so holy, you were not to partake of it. It's there, but not for them to eat it. And if they do partake of it, that's a horrible desecration of the holiness of that tree. Um, so Jubilees helps explain a little bit the whole thing about the tree of knowledge of good and evil because it's kind of unclear what, like there's a little bit lack of clarity in Genesis like why is the tree of knowledge of good and evil there in the first place well it's there according to Jubilees because it's a holy tree that's why it's there but it's so holy it's not supposed to be touched that helps explain it's this whole story in Genesis we're also you get the impression in Genesis, some people get this impression that they were in the Garden of Eden for a very small amount of time. Jubilee says, however, they were in the Garden for seven whole years. That gives a very different picture. If they're in the Garden for seven years, that 
they they were able to eat from the fruit of the trees for a long time. Another thing people don't realize is that they, they were never told that they could not eat from the tree of life before they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So it's almost certain, if they were in the garden for seven years, they had to have been eating from the tree of life during those seven years. Then it says, um, when it says they, they sinned and ate the fruit on the 17th of the second month. But then it says they only were kicked out of the garden a month later, like a month and a half later. They were, they had, they were kicked out of the garden the beginning of the fourth month. So that means from the time that they were cursed until they got out was almost like it was like a month and a half so what were they doing during that month and a half well they were probably still eating from the tree of life they were probably still eating from fruit in the garden and that's why when elohim saw that they kept eating from the tree of life like okay i don't want them to keep what does the tree of life do according to revelation it heals it heals them every month they eat from the tree of life and it and it heals their wounds and makes them young again basically Kind of like the fountain of youth almost but basically so elohim seeing that they keep eating from the tree of life he says i don't want them to keep living forever i don't want them to keep healing themselves so i'm going to kick them out of the garden so they can't keep eating from the tree of life the way some people say it doesn't make sense the way some people say it is i don't want them to be in the garden because if they eat one bite or if they eat a fruit from the tree of life then they're going to live forever They'll magically live forever. That doesn't make sense. But that's what a lot of people believe. But it makes more sense as Jubilees, uh, in the context of Jubilees, that, you know, they probably were eating the tree of life all the time. And it kept healing them. It makes sense for fruit to heal you and make you keep living if you keep eating healthy food because it's healing your sickness and disease. But it doesn't make sense for one little bite to make you immortal from a piece of fruit so these are just different slants that you get different perspectives perspectives on the whole story of genesis that make more sense when you see things like jubilees it doesn't seem as absurd like you can understand why a lot of atheists reject the account, the account in genesis because the way some people present genesis account seems really absurd and it also tells us that animals spoke before adam was cast out of the garden that's why the serpent was speaking now is this that far-fetched we, we a lot of people mock and laugh at this idea but we see birds are able to talk uh with almost perfect uh language they perfect language and um we have seen videos of certain animals giving making noises that sound very similar to words so it's very plausible that way long in the past that animals could speak and that they lost the ability to speak through divine intervention this account of of being kicked out of the garden in jubilees is very similar to the account of the tower of babel this account is so similar because the jubilees presents it as the animals could no longer speak in the same language as humans then humans and animals were kicked out of the garden and were dispersed it's the same thing that happened with the tower of babel where they had one language the people had one language and then after the events happened they were kicked out of babel and they were cast out to the places of the world so it's like a parallel here jubilee presents this story of the getting kicked out of the garden to be a parallel account to the tower of babel and it does it helps us to understand if the animals were able to speak that makes sense why the serpent was talking it doesn't make sense for the serpent to be talking when the animals couldn't speak and then uh, it says that only mankind was given the command to wear clothes to cover their shame but it says those who know the judgment of the law are expected to keep this it implies in Jubilees that the ignorant Gentiles are not condemned if they are ignorant of this law. 
so you know those tribes there are some tribes who don't who are who are uncivilized and you see them with topless you see them exposing themselves those tribes are not sinning because they're not aware of the judgment of the law they don't know that law of wearing clothes it's the same thing with a lot of people who are not bible based the people in our culture the people who you know they're in bikinis and they and they uh they dress very immodestly those people are not under the same law uh, that we are because they're ignorant of the law because they're ignorant they're not condemned necessarily just for wearing more revealing clothing they're condemned if they act promiscuously if they if you know if they sleep around and stuff but they're not condemned for uh, for being more revealing in their clothing this kind of helps us it helps us feel better about the Gentiles because it wouldn't be fair to condemn people for stuff they don't know, if they don't have access or if they don't know the law. Uh, so Jubilees gives us many indications, not just there, but in many other places where people are judged fairly in light of how much they know of the law. So if they don't know certain laws, they're not condemned for it in the same way. So those are just some interesting things about uh, about the Book of Jubilees. I guess maybe we should stop here. There's a lot of more amazing stuff to, to go through, but we kind of ran out of time this time. Do you want to say anything, Jackson? No, of course, I want to say thank you. It's very enlightening for me. Um, do you want to continue on? You can do what you want. Today? No, I'm talking about um, on Sundays. Yeah, but um, could we do it? Uh, could we do it uh, like uh, earlier than three thirty? Sure. Sometimes three thirty works for me, but sometimes if it's earlier, it would be better. Sure, I think I think uh, folks, what who does anything on Sunday? I guess. Yeah, <laughs> not any of us, but uh, we do know a bunch of church people. Yeah, what time <laughs> you want to do it? Before um, the Baptists get out? Say it again? Before the Baptists get out yeah. of church? <laughs> uh, I'm thinking something like 1.30, starting like 1.30. Okay. We'll make it the one thirty three club. <laughs> How's that yeah. sound? Uh, Sounds thank good. Thank you all for coming, too. I enjoyed you being here. I apologize for the bad internet connection. But I'll see you guys next week. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you.